Chapter 7 Calling for the Round Most beginners, unfortunately, have become interested in creating a line. I say unfortunately because they usually do things poorly and release a bunch of dogs that are a disgrace to the breed. There are, of course, one procedure cases where a novice gets lucky, but they are the exception, not the rule. Another factor is that people who know and care about dogs of all breeds are aware and concerned that there is an overpopulation of dogs a euro of all breeds. In those cases where prices for puppies of a particular breed remain high, it is because the breeders are few and far between and thus cooperate in letting prices inflate, thereby increasing the prestige of the breed. Purebred dogs of nearly every breed can be found in a large impounded dog warehouse, and we can't blame animal control or the humane society for euthanizing such animals, better a dead human than a miserable existence, roaming the streets and starving. Knowledgeable breeders of all breeds feel that a breed should only be done when it is likely to maintain or, even better, improve the quality of the breed. The reason a beginner has so much trouble breeding good dogs is not because he requires extensive genetic knowledge to do so, but rather because he has not learned to be selective enough in the dogs he breeds. He needs to select the best bitch he can buy and have her breed the best stallion. We must not diminish the quality of the bitch, as she contributes half of the chromosomes to each puppy. However, we can be more selective when targeting the stallion, as a prime stallion could conceivably be bred almost as close to the real good bitches in the country. Another factor to keep in mind is the quality of the potential parent's immediate ancestors. All I care about in a pedigree is the quality of the first three generations, and if there aren't any question marks among those fourteen dogs, I'm happy, as even good dogs tend to have straw tails. Staying within the line is an advantage and increases the uniformity of your results, but this is not as important as selection. Contrary to the popular saying, like does not produce like, since genes are tweaked differently in each puppy from the same litter, but you certainly get more good dogs from a good family than poor ones. Sometimes a pair of mutts makes a fighting dog or two, but they are the exception to the rule and certainly not an indication that it's okay to breed mutts. But why all this fuss about breeding good fighting dogs if we're only interested in breeding good dogs here and there? Well, for one thing, courage and fighting ability has been the hallmark of the race from the dark mists of antiquity. And, also, there is another thing about profound courage that is connected to a steady, panic-free disposition. Another problem a beginner has with good breeding is that he just doesn't know who the superior dogs are. It is for this reason that I am called into the round of some recent top dogs. I'm leaving the dogs I described in the Rogues Gallery chapter of my last book, but that's not to say that I still don't admire dogs like Art and Boomerang, far from it. It's just that I want to avoid repeating myself and almost all of the dogs I'm covering this time around are still alive. Some of them are quite old, but even if they were not available as stallions now, they would be of interest to the reader because of the possibility of their presence in the pedigree of a dog in which they are interested. Triple S Sooner Sooner is the ideal bulldog in every way, looks, temperament, intelligence, and fighting ability. Although Sooner has the perfect display conformation that makes him a winner and must mean he's good at fighting, he didn't even try to fight in his dogfighting days, as his style was to go to the bottom in order to get his prize. Favorite action of holding the thorax under the hind legs. He won three contests against some good dogs, in fact, he beat Blackie, the dog that killed his father Mordecai. He also beat a five-time champion. 
Morticles was a fighting dog who had won competitions before meeting Blackie, and he fought him for two hours, in fact, he was left overpowered for too long and died after the fight. Sooner's mother was Miss Kitty, a daughter of Jimmy Boots. She is a fighting bitch and despite being over ten years old she will still produce puppies. So Sooner had it all, pedigree, style, courage, and the perfect pit bull temperament, meaning the perfect temperament. In fact, Sooner's only vice was drinking beer. Every night his owner comes out to spend some time with him and to serve him some beer to drink. Mike's Sugar Ray Mike is another dog close to perfect conformation, and his pedigree leaves little to be desired. He is by art, a seven-time champion, and by candy, a three-time champion and a sister to Buddy of Stubblefield. Mike, a five-time champion himself, won a match after breaking his leg within the first ten minutes. Mike has won his fights at the hands of three different people a Euro, the knowledgeable breeder will discern that being able to outrun three different owners is a sign of class. Another sign of class was the dog's ability to come back and win a tough fight after being inactive for two years at the age of six. In that fight, he made 27 scratches under a broken leg. Mike wasn't ineffective, as he had what a fighting dog had, strong bite, fighting ability, good defense, a front, and the intelligence of a fighting dog. Obviously, he had guts. Turtle Buster This dog with the odd name is the essence of courage and everything else that is good about a bulldog, including excellent temperament. He was an eager worker and easily conditioned. He apparently saw movies of his opponent's fights and went into the fight with a plan. Turtle Buster was sired by Brutus, who in turn was sired by the large kingfish that sired so many good pit bulls, including Mike's mother, and Gaines Game and Grit. Fargo this dog is a turtle buster offspring and one of the strongest biting dogs you've seen in years. He is one of those very rare dogs that can break the bones of another pit bull. Perhaps the only issue about Fargo is his courage because no dog has been able to give him enough opposition to test his mettle. As the ancients used to say, I wish I had seen a dog that I could check if he was brave. Perhaps the greatest tribute to Fargo was paid by a protector of his losing opponent who said, he beat what I always consider to be an unbeatable dog. Bolt I mentioned Bolio in my last book, but since so many good dogs seem to be coming from him, I thought I'd elaborate a bit on the dog. Here was a dog that won only one fight and was retired as a stud. The reason was that his quality was so formidable that he was considered too valuable to continue fighting. Aside from that, he well proved it in his only fight, going up against a two-time champion, a dog many people considered an ace, and making the dog look so clumsy he conveniently couldn't get his way. What made Bolio so wonderful was that he had stamina that was all out of proportion to his size and he wasn't a small dog, and in rolls, he would take down a dog twice his size and work him hard. He was also a smart fighter, able to hold a dog and stay out of trouble. But one of the greatest assets was that he just liked to fight a lot, and that pleasure was not diminished by fatigue or a feeling of being defeated. In fact, this is a good definition of the pit bull trait that people call courage. Bolio came from Zeke, of whom Bob Wallace once said, few dogs could withstand a storm he unleashed on them. Luke of Farb This little dog is another art child from Fanny, who was Kingfish's daughter like Mike's mother. This dog is a lot smaller than the other dogs so far, around a few pounds, but he gives the impression of being able to take care of himself despite his size, 
as he appears to be absolutely indestructible. He is agile and bully, but with an unflappable calm disposition. Even at mealtime, when the other dogs are making noise, he calmly waits for food to come to him. He won three fights with dogs that themselves won three fights. Luke's Sugar Ray This is also another of Art's children, this time from Priscilla. In order to appreciate Art as a stud dog we have to understand that he was the only stud dog for eight months. Many dogs have been studded for many years and never produced as many wonderful dogs as Art, and I'm not even mentioning all the dogs that Art produced. Luke won several matches until he lost to Fargo. Yes, he was the one I was referring to when his owner said that Fargo beat what he thought was an unstoppable dog. Luke displayed unbelievable courage going up against an opponent who was capable of simply biting him where he was vulnerable. Bad Billy This is another dog that is one of those rare ones with bone-shattering power. He had an unusual style. Rather than trying to forcibly extort a dog and tackle him to the ground to get the better of him, Billy would get underneath the dog, grab him in the chest area just behind the front paws, and lift him in the air and, at the at the same time deliver a crushing bite to the chest area. Unlike the other bone crushers, Billy's courage is not an issue, as he once fought a large dog under conditions that put him at a disadvantage because of his odd fighting style. Instead of a rug, the pit was covered with a smooth tarpaulin, and whenever Billy went for his assault and tried to lift the dog into the air, his legs would spread out like an eagle with its wings spread. So Billy got the worst of that fight, but when his owner picked him up to save him at the hour and a half mark, he scratched courtesy like a bazooka. After that match, Billy promptly won another one, giving him five wins and one loss. Indian Bloomers this is a bitch I would rank as the best I have ever seen in terms of skill. I understand she was a fighter, too, but the only way they were to check on it was to put one dog after another in her to tire her out, because no dog she ever met in the ring was capable of being with her for more than 24 minutes. And she had some classic opponents, too. She had speed, a shattering bite, and a violence she had to be seen to believe. However, like so many fighting dogs, she was completely happy in her crate and could actually be let out with the other dogs. Bloomers came from a dog named Crusher who was bred by Curvino, and she had a daughter by Bolio. Adam from Queenie This bitch is a three-time champion and a daughter of art. The reader will notice that I have not listed many bitches. The reason is not that I don't consider female dogs important in the breed, because I consider them absolutely as important as dogs. However, you can pay a reasonable price for a stud and mate to any top dog candidates in the country, in fact, only a few of them are in reproduction. With the biggest bitches in the country, unfortunately, it's almost impossible to get the puppies they produce, and it's certainly impossible to get them, even when money is no object. So my recommendation of the two bitches was mainly for academic reasons and so the reader will know who they are when looking at them in pedigrees. Oh yes, Queenie came from the little bitch named Spider. Pool Hall Red this bitch was pregnant enough and her litters were so well spent that people often speak of those pool hall red hounds. She was an excellent dog, by all accounts a euro, talented and a fighter. She came from the immortal boomerang and meanie of Hyde. Now I haven't, by any means, listed anywhere near all of the relatively recent well-regarded dogs, but if I continued on endlessly, it would certainly become monotonous. The idea was to provide the reader with some dog names that will be candidates for the best dog in the country. 
There is always someone somewhere who will say something unkind to even the biggest of dogs, although the basis for doing so is only in their mind. Despite being relatively unflappable, I get a little upset when I hear that a four or five time winner is referred to as a mutt. First of all, I think we use that term loosely. Second, the term likely stemmed from a lack of courage arising from a dog not being a purebred pit bull, but I don't think the term should be thrown around occasionally. It was a 30-pound fighting machine that was finally going into action. John Tainter Foot. Chapter 8. Classic Tournaments. Current accounts of the fights that were written for my use are included in this chapter. Naturally, I refrain from mentioning names to protect the culprits. The people who wrote these accounts for me weren't after personal gain or even self-aggrandizement, because in almost all cases the dogs involved no longer belonged to their original owners, but people wanted the dogs to get the credit. The situation reminds me of an angler fishing out of season who caught a record-sized largemouth bass and left it on the dock with a note on it so the fish could take the record. The guy shouldn't be fishing out of season of course, but you have to admire his fisherman's spirit. In the fights described here, we have some elites, or cream de la cream, meeting, and such encounters made for classic confrontations and for deadlier fights. But even so, I think the reader will get a sense that the fights are not the cruel things they've been led to believe, brutal perhaps, but not cruel. Katie vs. Clamp Females a Euro, 25 kilos Reported by MC MC was relatively new to dogs when he joined us, using his dog Clamp. She was champion having won in 42 minutes and was champion because of her victory over Terror, a granddaughter of Going Light Barney. Clamp was a terribly rough, hard bite that could kill a dog if you knocked him to the ground. We were using Katie, a champion weighing in at 20 pounds. She, too, was a tempestuous one, as she beat LH in 13 minutes. We tried to compete her in kilos, but we couldn't compete her in that weight, so we decided to go ahead and compete her in 22 kilos with Clamp. Katie was the favorite bet, as not many people knew Clamp. Clamp weighed 23 pounds and Katie 22 pounds. But still money was married to Katie. When the bitches were released, no one else was betting on her because Clamp came like a dragon. She bit terribly hard and was winning over Katie. The only thing that saved Katie was her ability to stay out of serious trouble and hurt Clamp while she did it. After an hour, the bitches were still fighting decidedly, with Clamp driving and pushing the entire time. Meanwhile, Katie was hurting Clamp with her defensive tying. After an hour and five minutes, one lap in Clamp's favor, and she scratched slowly but steadily. At one hour and seven minutes, Katie rocketed forward. At one hour and ten minutes, Clamp started to go slower. At one hour and twelve minutes, Katie advanced wide open and had her first chance to go on the offensive. She inched in deeply squelching Clamp's strength, and Clamp had the count at one hour and seventeen minutes. Everyone who watched the fight watched a classic. Both bitches were violent, biting hard, and in excellent condition. Although Clamp gave up, she actually turned out to be a reasonably brave dog. Katie was fathered by the great breeder, and great dog himself. Wood Snooty, aka Snoopy, and mother by Hannah Patch to Coat. Clamp was fathered by Ernie de Snakeman and mother Linda de Ernie, a great granddaughter of Snooty. That fight was the best I've ever seen. Katie was tired, hurt and frustrated, but so far, she has shown no sign of giving up. 
She is a fantastic bulldog. Spike vs. Harry. Males a euro, 16 kilos. Reported by MC. This fight was the second time that HH had met AB and his dog Spike. Spike beat him earlier by 38 minutes. Spike is a son of Snooty and is a devastating, strong biter. No dog has ever lost to Spike. HH knew this and brought in a Jeep and Charlie half-brother. His dog was known for a superb head and muzzle that could keep a rough, hard-biting dog away from him. The fight was in Harry's favor, as Spike couldn't do his usual chest thrust. But around the 22-minute mark, Spike charged in and did the damage, however, Harry charged in with a good snout grab. Then at the 52-minute mark, Spike rolled Harry into the corner and punished him so badly that he went into shock. HH withdrew from the fight immediately as his dog had no chance of winning and was in terrible condition. This made Spike a very impressive two-time champion dog. Bucky vs. Geronimo Males a Euro, 22 kilos Reported by RG Ryle was using his two-time champion Geronimo, a grandson of Boomerang. Geronimo had just beaten four-time champion Luke, a son of art. Geronimo was known as a terrible punisher who could take one out in a matter of minutes. Chavis was using his champion Bucky, who was only 20 months old at the time. Bucky's style was to keep his opponent out until he could exhaust him and then finish him off. His big body was out of the ordinary, and when I first saw him, I thought he was going to fight at 25 kilos, as he was a big dog for his 22 kilos. This fight went somewhat in his favor as Bucky kept Geronimo out and wore him out. At the 1 hour and 47 minute mark, the fight was called off and to everyone's surprise, Geronimo made a nice scratch. This was one of those fights in which a perfect defensive dog was able to defeat a rough, biting dog. Bucky had four-time champion Jocko as a father and a Trump red bitch as a mother. Geronimo was fathered by Zeb de Johnson, a two-time champion whose father was Boomerang. Tater vs. Rastus Males a Euro, 26 kilos Reported by PP Tater crushed the toughest, biggest dogs around with ease and at least ten times in fights. Even with his upper canines broken, Tater was considered unstoppable by those who saw him fight. Tater was a brutal fighter. He was a powerful brawler and would smash dogs to the ground and against the walls of the pit. Even with his broken canines, he was a strong biter, and no dog ever spent more than 15 minutes with him. Rastus was known as the most violent of the dogs in Carver's backyard. He has broken dog legs in fights several times. Tater came in at 25 pounds in excellent condition. Rastus came in at 26 kilos, also in excellent condition. Both were at his best weight. For the first 15 minutes, Tater was in control. He stayed over his ear and prevented Rastus from making any good lunges. Fifteen minutes in, Rastus made his first lunge at Tater's leg, and the damage was substantial. For the next twenty minutes, Rastus continued to work on the leg he was holding, and Tater couldn't leave. Tater went for the chest and throat, but Rastus was paralyzing him. By forty minutes, Tater had little use of his front legs and had to fight from that point on. A lap was made by Rastus at the 35-minute mark. He was doing 35th that night, and both stopped short after 45 minutes. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. 
Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater ten seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater ten seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. Over the next hour though, Rastus beat Tater brutally with Tater biting hard from the bottom when he had a chance. Ten scratches were made by each dog. It would take Tater ten seconds to get through, falling and getting up again to push his way through. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. At around one hour and forty-five minutes, Rastus had slowed down considerably, and the fight was tied. I think Rastus was starting to go into shock. At two hours and six minutes, Rastus had his count. Tater gave a good courtesy scratch. Tater's legs were in bad shape but not broken. During the fight, Rastus showed two unusual techniques. He would shake Tater so hard he would fly through the air. Every time Tater tried to snout Rastus, Rastus would shake him and make him miss. Rastus would catch Tater's legs at unusual angles, making it difficult for Tater to catch his snout. Tater and Rastus were two of the best and most powerful dogs that ever lived, I'm sure. They had it all, strength, power, courage, strong bite, and skill. It's just too bad they had to meet, but if they hadn't, I would have missed the best fight I've ever seen. Rastus was very well bred, and I would have loved to have owned him. He was one of the best fighting machines I ever saw. Tater's Courage, Durability Henry vs. Red Jack Males a Euro, 23 kilos Reported by P.P. Red Jack is by Stu Fowler out of Goldie by Curvino Henry is from Tater out of Faith from Patrick Red Jack came in at 50 pounds, trained to perfection Henry came in at 50 pounds, a little light. His conditioning was favorable, at his peak, and he wasn't at his full power due to his low weight. For the first hour, Red Jack was a hurricane, throwing Henry around the ring. Red Jack was beating Henry by a wide margin and completely dominating the contest. He worked on the head, forepaws, chest, and sometimes even suffocation. Henry fought back and retaliated from the bottom with head and chest grabbing. He was the strongest biter, and he occasionally hurt. 
Even though Jack dominated the fight, he was using more energy than Henry because he was conserving his strength. From an hour to an hour and a half, Red Jack was still well ahead, but he started to slow down noticeably. Henry came up a few times. The first scratch was 30 minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made eight hard scratches until the two-hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at two hours and ten minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, Henry scratched like a rocket at the two-hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within three feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. The first scratch was thirty minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made eight hard scratches until the two-hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at two hours and ten minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, Henry scratched like a rocket at the two-hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within three feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. The first scratch was thirty minutes into a called lap for Henry. Each made eight hard scratches until the two-hour mark. The fight was evenly matched at the two-hour mark and from that point on Henry started to win. He came in to finish off Red Jack with an incredible display of determination and reserve strength. A handle was made at two hours and ten minutes, it was Red Jack's turn to scratch, Henry scratched like a rocket at the two-hour mark. Red Jack slowly got within three feet of Henry and then turned and slowly walked to the side of the ring and he took the count. Zebo vs Greaser Males a euro, 22 kilos. Reported by MC. The Fastenaz got tired of hearing about Hudson's Tex, Maurice Carves' dog from Bully's son out of Arts Missy. Everyone was continually talking about how terrible Tex was and how nothing could stop him. So the Fastenaz brothers went looking for the best 50-pound dog they could find and bought the champion greaser. This dog won four fights out of three for the best breeder in the competition. He was considered to be one of the best of his weight in the country. The Fastenaz and Houston, Tex's owner, agreed to the match, but Tex fell ill towards the end of his feeding. In order not to be penalized Houston asked David West to take over the fight. West agreed to use Zebo but since he only had two weeks to work with Zebo, he would concede the fight if the dog didn't win in 30 minutes. Until then, Fastenaz thought Houston was using Texas Houston and West had no idea what the Fastenas were bringing. Zebo weighed two kilos less. The Fastenaz were trying to raise the stakes and mask their fear for Zebo when they saw him. Ayuroa, this is the killer dog, a euro they went on to say, referring to Zebo's last four wins. There were quite a few fans on both sides. The fight was filmed, and the footage showed West bossing Zebo around from the start. Zebo was all attack, attacking Greaser from all directions and working the chest and shoulders. Greaser was going crazy and pushing around trying to get rid of Zebo. Zebo punters, unfamiliar with Greaser's style, were betting heavily on Zebo. It looked like Zebo was going to destroy one more unless Greaser backed into the corner of the pit. But pushing and pushing and turning was part of Greaser's style, and he still had no intention of stopping. One breeder thought he had seen the strange piebald dog before, and when the handler called him, 
greaser, his suspicions were confirmed. So West withdrew, and cut him down. But Greaser was already badly wounded at the front. The tide turned several times. When Greaser was in front, he kept Zebo spinning in the center of the line. Greaser would be on one side of Zebo, working his muzzle and head, with Zebo trying to get a hold. Occasionally, Zebo would catch Greaser in the corners and go back to the chest. Zebo was very fast and if he saw an opening, he would immediately make a hold. As usual, however, Greaser forced Zebo's head down and pulled his body out of harm's way, moving in circles. The film was filmed from a position above the ring, so the scene was looking straight down. One cut scene showed Zebo throwing Greaser upside down, and you could see Greaser's chest. It looked as if someone had discharged a shotgun inside it. But at one point it looked like Greaser had beaten Zebo. Zebo looked like he had given it all he had and could do no more. He was in the center of the pit, the one where Greaser was always trying to keep him, breathing hard as Greaser held him by the side of the head and punished him severely. But Zebo caught his breath and trapped Greaser in a corner. Every time he scratched at the chest, Greaser would bend further to the ground. The film shows the Fastenaz pacing back and forth, shaking their heads, where Zebo had brought Greaser to the ground. They shook hands with the other coach and assistant and conceded defeat. Greaser was an incredibly brave and smart dog. If Zebo hadn't hit him so hard in the beginning, he might have won as he kept Zebo in serious trouble for a good part of the fight. Both dogs took their scratches like bullets, but Greaser was the one who was badly hurt. Thanks to Fastenaz's medical skill, he managed to survive, and he was retired as a stud. The Third Competition of 35 Almost as an afterthought, I decided to include an account of this struggle sent to me via letter by the dog's owner. One reason for including the fight is that it is an excellent example of how a handler can properly work with their dog in a dog fight. First, a few words about the dog and its owner. We'll call his owner, Perry, and I've known him since before he was bred with fighting dogs. Prior to his interest in fighting dogs, he did obedience work with a variety of breeds and was primarily interested in retrievers. In fact, he was quite a good trainer of retrievers, and no doubt all this experience with other breeds put him in good shape later with fighting dogs. Once he became interested in the bulldogs he was a loser and there was nothing to save him as he caught the fever. I really doubted he would ever go to the pits though, as he was always in awe of anyone who could be cold-headed enough to put their dogs in the pits. He has been pitting dogs for nearly ten years and has won more than he has lost. But he never lost a dog in a fight, winning or losing. This helps to explain the rather chivalrous attitude on his part to let 35 be tested for courage himself. You see, Perry got 35 from an addict for $35, 35, hence the name, and he did it more as a favor to the dog than anything else, since the guy wasn't taking good care of him and the young dog's parentage was unknown. Perry thought he might at least be able to use the dog as an amateur fighting dog to train other better breed dogs. But as it turned out, once 35 started fighting, he had more talent than the other A Euro Good Euro dogs he was training. In fact, he was simply too rough for a training dog. Because of that, Perry decided to try to get him into competitions. Surprisingly, he won two in a row, completely overwhelming his opponents, however, he won in such a way that his courage was never tested. Perry was beginning to suspect that even if the breed was unknown, 
the dog must have been well bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter, even though the breed was unknown, the dog must have been well bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter, even though the breed was unknown, the dog must have been well bred. The proof of his courage, if he had it, would be in his ability as a stud dog producing good dogs of courage. None of his descendants are old enough to know the answer to the second question, but the first was answered in the struggle that is described in the following section of Perry's letter. As far as the dogs are concerned, there isn't much new except the story of 35's third fight, which I'm sure you've heard by now, but I thought I could provide some interesting details and observations. The fight was organized with the help of a very kind man named Dan Wylands. The other group was upper class, and there was virtually no bone of contention in the arrangement. Our training went well, and we were to meet in Oklahoma. We arrived in Reagan just in time to learn of the recent law passed on the new criminal law. In case you've been listening in detail, I'll relate some of the main points, a fine of $25,000, 3 to 10 years in prison, going to look is a misdemeanor, but taking a spectator to the pit or selling beer, etc., it's a crime. In Oklahoma, dog fighting has been elevated to armed robbery status. I shuddered all over when I learned that the governor signed the document as an emergency measure so it wouldn't have to wait the usual 90 days to become effective. I almost turned around and went back home. What really surprised me was Reagan's attitude about this. Rather than get rid of the evidence and paraphernalia, he said he would just wait and see if they enforced the law or not. Anyway, even on the verge of a nervous breakdown, I wanted to go through with the fight and so we stayed, though, I might add, against a feeling that we should get out of there. The fight was close to 21 kilos, which we consider the minimum for 35. Each side got its own scales, and Reagan used his too. We took cover and brought with us a 25 kilo weight used to test elevators with which the scale would be reset if there was controversy. Well, when we put the dogs on the scales, there was a, a one half kilo difference, with us being the heaviest. We were overweight on their scale but on ours it was fine. So we went to test weight. Then a heated debate ensued about how to reset the balance. Well, after spinning our wheels for nearly an hour, the judge decided that we should use the Reagan scale as a neutral solution. By our test, Reagan's scale was 1 slash 2 pound lighter, but we stuck to it. We washed the dogs and put him in the ring without further ado and the battle was on. 35 charged ahead but their dog, a two-time champion too, jumped completely on ours and caught him in the back of the back, and stabbed him near the tail sharply, causing an alarming amount of blood flow. I've never seen anything like this before and neither have anyone who was present. I remained confident, of course, that the blood would dry, but the dogs were hitting each other so hard and fast that the force of the battle left the wound open. It didn't dry for a good ten minutes, and I knew he'd lost a dangerous amount of blood. Friday Five was doing the best he could, but it became apparent almost immediately that he didn't have the punishing bite he had shown in his previous fights. And as time went on, he was weakening from blood loss. It was decision time, and I decided that if 35 was going to stop, 
I would give him a chance to do it now and thereby eliminate the possibility of creating him with the mistaken opinion that he was brave. By that time my skin should have been as pale as if I'd lost all that blood, but I tried to get my head together and help the dog if I could. By the thirty-minute mark, our dog was so weak he could barely break free of the tether and was failing. I knew our only hope was to change the momentum of the fight by starting with a scratch. Our dog was desperately fighting now to get a hold, and he did a rolling maneuver to try to get the other dog out of his ears so he could catch him. It didn't work as the other dog was still holding him, but I asked the judge for a turn on my dog, and he consented to it. At this point I didn't know if Thridy Five could or would scratch, as he was so weak. But when I turned him to the corner he kept looking around my leg trying to see the other dog. When I let him go he took off on the other dog. I said to myself, we haven't lost yet. Up to this point, I had already given up to test 35's metal. I wanted to see what mood the red dog was in under scratching also wanted to give Thridy Five as much time to recover in the corner as possible, so I grabbed him again and guess what? The red dog hesitated for about three seconds before he scratched hard at us. Face, this caught the audience's attention. And slowly Thridy Five started to give some ear holds and start to balance a little bit. The red dog was starting to get tired and lay down but scrambled to his feet to get 35, only to claw his way back to the top. I continued treating 35 whenever possible, and the rest helped him far more than they did the red dog. The difference, of course, was that while 35 was low on blood and strength, the other was low on heart. He continued with the scratch though, and he improved over his hesitation on the first scratch, but he still wasn't readily starting when released. I knew then that we must make him abandon the fight. He was brave enough to continue as long as he was ahead. I knew we had to do something about it, and I started looking for opportunities to send 35 in. Finally he dropped the red one and took on a stifle but wasn't really doing anything with it. I thought, it's now or never, and jumped up there yelling encouragement at him. He recovered and shook the stifle a little, and I just kept yelling, now show him who the bulldog is. And he did. There were two more scratches, but the red was fading fast, and 35 was doing a good scratch. Finally, the stifle binding in the red was up for the count. We won. Now all we had to do was save our dog and get him home. It took one hour and thirty-two minutes, by the way, and we saved him and got him home safely. Dick, honestly speaking 35 is the best fighting dog I ever saw. When he is well he can make most dogs look like idiots in comparison, and when he is not well he can win with sheer determination and courage. By the way, the red dog could have won if he had the heart. He was still the strongest dog physically. He was an excellent fighting dog, just not that brave deep down. The clock is always more important in this type of balanced fight. They will stay ahead, of course. In his last fight before ours, the red dog had come from 1,600 kilometers to beat a four-time champion. Reagan said the red dog was ahead the entire time and won with just over an hour. Later in the fight when I was holding 35 in the corner, he felt almost limp and would hang his head down, making me wonder at every scratch if he had the strength to go. But I let him loose, and he went straight for the red dog in his corner. He really is a classic example of what a bulldog can and should be, and we are all proud of him. I plan to breed him to all the females in my city. Whatever was his offspring, she produced it. 
and I have faith in him. Authors note, in the book of the American Pit Bull Terrier, I had a chapter on a convention consisting of common dog fights for two reasons. One was to give the reader an idea of a euro a euro what a dog fight was really like. And the other was to establish that dog fights didn't normally end in death. In fact, none of the dogs at that convention died. Here we have absolute war machines in these classic tournaments. Such fights are more likely to end in the death of one, or both, participants. Fortunately, such encounters are rare. But in the tournaments we describe for us here, only one dog died, Red Jack. How can such a thing be true when you have the latest in destruction machines employed with each other? Well, there are three reasons actually. One is that the breeder involved was responsible and acknowledged responsibility for his charges. They gave up fights when the dogs' lives were in danger. Second, they all developed expertise in medically treating dogs injured in combat, or having them receive competent care. And finally, big dogs, in addition to being formidable, are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. They are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. They are also indestructible. They are strong, shock-resistant, hard to hurt, and hard to kill. Breeding dogs like these is what keeps the American Pit Bull Terrier a unique animal that it is. To punish me for my disdain for authority, fate made me one. Albert Einstein It's strange how much you have to learn before you know how little you know. Unknown Author Chapter 9 Training Your Dog Scratch Method Before I begin the subject in this chapter, an explanation and caveat are in order. First, why should I write a chapter like this? Why throw more fuel on the fire of Stratton is a dog keeper camp? Well, everything I write is done with the welfare of the breed in mind. But other people write about dogs, 2A Euro, specifically journalists or magazine writers who get their information from animal welfare officials. Such employees typically know very little, so they let their imaginations run wild. Unfortunately, his words are accepted as Bible and dutifully recorded. Such nonsense is pernicious for two reasons. First, it hardens the public's attitude toward pit bull owners. Second, and even more important, it gives novice creators ideas they would normally never have. One example will suffice. One particularly ridiculous fact posed by humanist groups was the common practice of fighting dog breeders amputating their front legs. The purpose of this atrocity was supposedly to enable the dog with the short front legs to get under his opponent and rip his stomach. Now, nobody knows better than a typical fighting dog breeder exactly what incredible nonsense this is. But a fighting dog's game is hard to break. Newcomers are not welcomed with open arms, as is the case with any other pastime. For good reason breeders are wary of outsiders looking for information and are more likely to turn them away. Where do newbies get their information from? Good, the greatest available source is the media. If the media says that dogs must be trained by cats and small dogs, newbies may subconsciously enough lean towards such atrocities. However, I don't think anyone would be stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. 
Sadly, I was wrong, dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously? I don't think anyone would be so stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. Sadly, I was wrong, dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously? I don't think anyone would be so stupid or cruel enough to amputate their dog's front legs. Sadly, I was wrong. Dogs with little leather boots on where their paws once were, limping along the other end of the leash. Now, in a case like this, who deserves our hate, the animal welfare officers who made up this story or the poor sick idiot who took the story seriously? Well, anyway, it's my hope that I can help prevent many maiming inspired atrocities by giving the true version of how to breed your dog for the purpose of fighting. But first, the caveat I mentioned earlier. Are you sure you want to do this? Every aspect of a dog show is hard work, and no one has ever made a profit from it. Worse, you risk breaking the law. And even if you've never broken another law in your life, you could even be sentenced to custodial terms. But why should this be? How can perpetrators of violent crimes receive lesser sentences than those accused of racing their dogs? For example, simple assault is a lesser crime in many states than dogfighting. The first is a vicious attack on a person, the latter merely an assault on the sensibilities of those who know nothing of fighting dogs and, perhaps, grow faint-hearted from any strenuous activity. The incongruity of the legal system in this regard is evidently absurd. However, I have a theory that explains its existence. With the reader's indulgence, I will now break down my speech to a few paragraphs. Although the general public seems to be blithely ignoring the situation, scientists have the grim knowledge that the world has been on a course of destruction for the past two centuries. To be brief, the problem is overpopulation. Part of the world's population has been living on the verge of starvation. With the advancement of technology, however, our population has been supplied with more food and thereby doubled at ever-increasing rates, and the number of people going hungry has increased astronomically. But this is only part of the problem. For every kilogram of human flesh, a kilogram of non-human flesh must be sacrificed. Hence, animal and plant species are being driven towards extermination at an alarming rate. The extinction pattern during the Great Dinosaur, of dinosaurs, mainly, in the Cretaceous period was approximately one species per hundred years. Now it's almost one species a day. Our humanists who beat their chests, and pass laws, about the imaginary cruelty of dogfighting must consider what happens to wild animals whenever land is cleared for a new mall or housing development. If our humanists are really concerned about animals, they will join in trying to bring our population under control. Biologists lament the loss of species, animal and plant, because they haven't had a chance to study them, in fact, some species became extinct before they were even discovered. However, there are other reasons for concern. We do not yet understand the mutual relationship of species. We humans are part of the fabric of life, and we are abysmally ignorant of our possible dependence on one or more species becoming extinct. Not only that, but many of our most important medicines come from plants. Who knows? 
The cure for cancer may be contained in one of the plant species currently being extirpated in the Amazon rainforest. But let's be optimistic and assume that there is no unknown essential relationship for any endangered species. Yet you want a world in which only people, algae, and perhaps little animal food left. Maybe we will have zoos where we can see real-life cats and dogs. Other problems include accelerating deforestation in South America's forests. Such tremendous loss of fauna and flora is destined to alter our atmosphere with unpredictable consequences. Part of the problem with all of this is that there's an inherent retard reaction to all our craziness. Once we start to experience this, it will probably be too late for anything to be done about it. Even the great oceans, perhaps the only real place, are being polluted to such an extent that the algal population must be endangered. If it does, so will a large part of our oxygen supply. Overpopulation is a factor in almost every major modern problem. More people care less and less about everything and everyone, thus, everything becomes more valuable due to its scarcity a euro, and economists try to illustrate why we cannot stop inflation. War becomes more and more inevitable. Third world people don't like to go hungry. Riches diminish. We haven't seen the end of the gas lines. Pollution increases. We will end up poisoned with our own leftovers. Ah, well, my intention is not to depress anyone or even recruit members for the zero population increase, although I wouldn't be unhappy with the second result. I proceeded to explain the notoriety of dog fighting laws. The problem, as I see it, lies in people's psychology. Precious metals and minerals are made like that, because of their scarcity. If diamonds were as common as granite, they would have the same value. Can it be, that the superabundance of human results, callous attitude towards each other? Is this why a person can be systematically murdered in the big city, and bystanders don't want to be involved? And is this why crimes involving animals are elevated to greater importance than those involving humans? Whatever the case, you are stuck with the fact that the law can deal more severely with fighting dog breeders than with burglars. If you get arrested a euro, and keep in mind that you were wrongly arrested a euro, you won't be able to take much solace in knowing that the laws are bad. The laws have been put on the books by politicians who know nothing about fighting dogs and have been pressured by ignorant others who are looking out for their own private interests. An additional vexation of dog racing is that because of the illicit nature of the activity, there is very little reward in the normal sense. Up to success. If your dog wins once, twice or even fifty times, you won't be able to tell many people about it. You can report your dog's competitions in a trade magazine, but for your benefit use a pseudonym when doing so. It makes even more sense not to report anything. So there is little glory in fighting. There will be no news in the papers, and no dog food producer will give their dog an award for Best Pit Dog of the Year. Although, Surely, there could be no greater ceremonial given to a dog ration than to say that it was used successfully in training a pit dog for the most demanding of competitions. Starting There are two ways to get a dog that will become a fighting dog. One way is to buy an experienced dog, one that has won a fight or two. Unfortunately, you'll need contacts you don't have to do this. Also, you can expect to pay a very high premium for such a dog, because the owner may have waited a long time and raised a kennel full of dogs to get a dog of that caliber. A more promising approach is to acquire a well-bred female dog. 
Information elsewhere in this book will help you determine whether or not the puppy is good breeding. Keep in mind that it is important for parents and grandparents to be fighting dogs. Anything less involves compromise, and you pay too high a price for compromise in the long run. Assuming you've managed to find the appropriate female, or more accurately, a litter that is properly bred, how do you choose the pup? There's no secret to choosing a good puppy. Simply get the puppy that is the healthiest and catches your eye, as each puppy has a chance to become good. Well, actually, they won't be given equal chances, but the determination of such things, the genes, is not subject to significant scrutiny. Either way, the plan is for it to be your base bitch. You will use it to get a line of starting dogs. For that reason, it's not as important as she appears to be, as you will be building on the breeding that is upon her and the selection of an appropriate sire to serve as the foundation for your dogs. Another short-term route, albeit a much more expensive one, is to buy a well-bred adult female dog. In that case, it would be good to have one that is tested in courage, but then again, it's likely to be an expensive proposition to buy one. It's better to have a bitch deficient in courage that comes from solid fighting dog breeding than the other way around. However, it is only at this point, when you are just starting out, that you should allow yourself the luxury of compromise, for example, in this case, mating a non-game bitch. Either way, whether you get a puppy or an adult female dog, take her to a vet and get her health checked. If there is a problem, an honorable breeder will refund your money or discreetly make a replacement. If you've got an adult dog, you'll want to have everything ready for him, or her, at home. Even if you plan to keep your dog as a pet, have an enclosure ready set up outside. Get him used to it, and bring him indoors for a short, supervised period. If these sessions were well designed, gradually increase them. The reason I suggest such cautions here is not that the pit bull is such an untrustworthy animal but because any kennel is more likely to have a hard time adjusting to life than a pet dog and is likely to commit serious indiscretions. In addition to the obvious dirt on the carpet, your dog might gnaw on the furniture or jump on the kitchen table. Whatever the affront, the punishment must be the same. Don't show too much anger, simply say no and take the dog outside to its kennel or chain. The idea is to avoid making the punishment too severe that it will cloud the outcome. And, believe it or not, pit bulls are sensitive dogs that don't like to be in trouble. For this reason, they are usually easily trained. Shaft and Chain Installation For outdoor installation, you need to make a choice between installing a kennel or chain. The kennel has the advantage of being more compact, taking up less space than most chains, and the dog does not have to wear a collar. It is for the latter reason that show dog breeders prefer kennels, as they do not want matted neck hair. However, a dog is less accessible in a kennel, and you will likely have to keep him cemented which can be unpleasant for bones and joints. An alternative is to use gravel leveling, but this type of foundation is difficult to clean. I have known people with various dog breeds who used both kennels and chains, and, unless they were devoted to show dogs, they invariably preferred chains. I also noticed a recent article in the hunting dogs section of Field and Stream that advocated chain installation as being superior to kennel. It would be advantageous, however, to have at least one kennel for the bitch in heat or about to give birth. The simplest installation of chain is the ring and o-ring type. You need two large, heavy harness rings, two support links, and two spinners. Attach the rings and spinners to the end of the chain, 
and simply drive a pin through the a euro 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 of the larger ring. Leave the head of the pin at least 6 inches above floor level so that there is plenty of room for free movement of the o-ring. The main danger with this type of installation is that the chain will become tangled and the dog will wrap tightly around the pin, unable to reach shade or water. For this reason, you should check the dog frequently to make sure it is not tangled up. This problem lessens considerably after current movement has bypassed the area. You can prevent the problem by clearing the area of a euro a euro rocks, sticks, and so on and leveling off any high spots near the stud that the chain might snag. Chain size is an important consideration, too, because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Chain size is an important consideration, too, because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Chain size is an important consideration, too, because a dog can break a surprisingly heavy chain if he gets excited and starts lunging for it. Fortunately, most dogs become chain aware and will not repeatedly slash the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Most dogs become a euro o chain a wary euro and will not repeatedly strike the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. Most dogs become a euro o chain a wary euro and will not repeatedly strike the end of the chain with all their might. If a chain is too heavy, some of the links will wear out pretty quickly from dragging on the ground at one point in the chain. Spinners are very important to prevent the chain from being tangled. It is easier for the chain to break when tangled and of course can cause the dog to get hurt around the pin. The pulley and chain system. This type of system works best where there is plenty of space and lots of trees, and is by far the best way to keep large numbers of dogs. Unfortunately, it is more difficult to erect and maintain a simple pin and chain system. First, you need to decide where your cables will run. Select an area as flat as possible and one that is free of large irremovable rocks in which the chain could snag. The tree will need some cable protection, otherwise it will gradually penetrate the bark of the tree and when it enters the vascular system of the tree, it will kill the tree. A thick strip of flat tire will do the job, at least for a while, but a better solution is to use a lightweight metal sheet that can be bent around the tree and nailed into place. The cable can be securely placed over the sheet metal with a cable clamp. 
Before you can put the cable on the other tree, you need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. You need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. You need to put the pulleys on the cable. It's a good idea to include extra pulleys. That way, if one breaks, you don't have to pull the cable out to reattach it. The length of chain attached to the pulley must be at least long enough to reach the ground. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. Attach a spinner to one link, then another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. He attaches a spinner to one link, then to another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. The dog needs to have enough lateral space to be able to go into his crate with enough excess chain so that it doesn't pull on him. He attaches a spinner to one link, then to another link to connect the chain. At the other end, you mount it the same way, link pulley link, but now attach it to a big harness ring so you can pass it through the dog's collar. The most important items for a pulley assembly are the stops. They are to prevent the dog from reaching the tree, in case he is inclined to gnaw, or having his chain wrapped around it. It also prevents wear and breakage of pulleys. Measure the chain distance from the tree. At the point you chose for your stopper, place a U-bolt clamp. Make sure extra pulleys are between the tree and the U-bolt clamp. Now wrap the U-bolt clamps with layers of coarse fabric of cotton wool until you have a round shape the size of a baseball. Cover with good quality plastic tape, and you have a nice padded stopper for your pulley system. Don't forget to put one on each end, too. Be sure to clear anything that can catch on the chain, such as twigs. Kennels It's hard to beat the professional builders in kennel construction. You might want to take care of the base yourself, though, if you're used to working with cement. As mentioned earlier, cement can be unpleasant for a dog's joints, so you may only want to cement the edges of the walkway to prevent the dog from digging. Dirt, plain and simple, is the best foundation, and if a puppy is kennel raised, he probably won't try to dig. In this case, you can go unnoticed with the dirt background without any cement work. The dog's house. If you live in a cold place, you're obviously going to need a more substantial and better insulated dog house than if you reside in a warm climate. In this case, 
professionals do not always do a good job, because they often place the entrance flush with the floor, and also make it too large. What is needed in cold climates is a small, just big enough for the dog to conserve body heat, double insulated house with an opening wide enough for the dog to enter, and it's amazing how the dog can squeeze through. The opening should be well above the ground so that the house will retain a lot of straw, and the dog can snuggle up into it, with only his nose out. The opening can also be covered with a burlap tip. Diet Everyone has their favorite dog food, but most of the popular dog foods are well balanced and adequate. Unlike people, dogs prefer to eat the same food every day, in fact, they are susceptible to runaways from a simple change of food. Select a good ration, and stick to it. I add hot water and some canned dog food, along with a liquid skin and coat supplement. One argument in giving kibble is that in its dry form the food helps to clean the dog's teeth. Also, if a dog doesn't finish his food, the kibble won't attract flies like wet foods will. Raising the pup. Whether you chose a male or a female, your animal's training and care should be the same. Training will mainly consist of introducing the dog to activities that will go with exercise. Thus, playing with your pup and encouraging him to play tug of war with some artifact will eventually lead him to stretch work. The younger the dog is started on the treadmill, the better he will work on it when mature. Most dogs will run around in the walker for the sheer pleasure of it. There is a rare exception where a chicken needs to be put in a cage or a dog in front of him to excite him enough to work. You may want to start your puppy off with slow steps daily and gradually build up the distance. The young dog will look forward to your jogging sessions, and unless you're a marathon runner, he'll soon be at the point where you won't be able to give him enough exercise that way. A love of exercise is the very essence of a pit bull, and it's fun to watch one enjoying himself in the walker or spring pole, a device for exercising the dog, it consists of a pole or tree branch with a sturdy piece of cloth on the tip to encourage the dog to jump and grab the cloth. This can also be done with a pole and the exerciser holds the pole and raises and lowers it like a spring. If you are going to put your dog in conformation shows, the dogs that have been working are more likely to capture the attention of the judges due to the superior muscle combination in evidence. Also, with the advent of weight pulling competitions becoming more popular, the dog with a little conditioning will obviously have the upper hand. And don't get carried away by talk of taking your dog to fights if you're not inclined to do so. An acre of performance is worth more than all the promises in the world. James Howell Chapter 10 The Proving Ground Contrary to the legend perpetuated by animal welfare groups about using puppies and small dogs as baits to train a fighting dog, one who is truly familiar with fighting dogs will not allow any contact with mutts. For one reason, it's not good for the young dog to fight a mutt, big or small, as the snarling, yelping, and other, odd, behavior of the mutt will be a puzzle to him, and certainly will. It will do him no good. One of the reasons for this is that the mutt, for example, not pit bull, fights out of fear or authority, whereas the pit bull fights for the sheer pleasure of it, like the hound dog that stalks for the sheer pleasure of it. In any case, the best experience for a suitor fighting dog is to go up against another pit bull, preferably one of age and experience who is not as rough, you don't want a puppy who is forced and loses confidence in himself, but be astute to teach the pup a few tricks of the trade. A good question is when to start raising a puppy, and it's not an easy question to answer. 
Some of the old ones made it a rule never to do anything with young dogs until they were two years old. However, there were dogs that won several competitions at this age. Here's what you should consider. Some dogs won't start until they're close to two years old, or older, and others rarely will when they're less than three months old. The age at which they start fighting seems to have very little to do with how they turn out. Even if your young dog is dying to fight at a young age, it would be better not even against other puppies, because at a young age they could lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Because at a young age they may lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Because at a young age they may lose their canine teeth. Apparently, the jaw bone has not yet become strengthened. If you put him in a sparring match when your dog is less than two years old, be sure to keep those fights short, a pleasurable experience for him. And remember that the vast majority of dogs never reach their potential until they're three years old. Sometimes, too, a young dog can deceive you by being full of fights, but when you put a dog in front of him he will squeal and carry on like a mutt or perhaps just bend over and let the dog chew him, all the while wagging his tail. In either case, get the dog off him, and don't allow your dog to have any other contact with dogs for a few months. There are three different views on how much training with other dogs a young dog should have before competing. It has been said that each fight takes its toll from the dog's psyche, as if he only had so much courage, and a little bit is used in each training fight. Well, I don't believe it, in fact, I think easy sparring actually builds a dog up and gives him confidence for whatever tough battles may be waiting ahead. The question is, should it be tried out in your game before competing? I suppose I belong to the school of concepts that believes that competition is the test of the game. This is where you can see how your dog stacks up against quality competition dogs. And the whole purpose of competing dogs is to find which dogs are the best, to know which dogs to breed. Presumably your young suitor did well in the sparring matches before you decided to compete him, because he will most likely have a much tougher journey because he will likely meet a much tougher opponent in this fight. That is, of course, because the other guys selected their suitors from the best of their lot, too. Once you've decided to race your dog, there are a number of things to consider. First, there's weight, and presumably, you've determined how heavy your dog is and how strong he is without fat. Remember, there are two reasons for dropping dog weight. One is that it doesn't carry unnecessary weight, like fat. The other is to prevent the dog from going to a bigger dog. It is certainly possible to err and bring your dog too light a weight in a weak condition. For that reason, it's good to keep in mind that if you're going to miss the weight, it's better to miss heavy than light. Getting the exact weight right takes experience and a certain amount of dog knowledge. Another consideration is the time of year for the competition because you'll want to avoid the heat, and for good reason. One of the reasons the dog is not stronger than we are is because of his ability to keep his body at a cool temperature, if his temperature reaches a certain level above, death is inevitable. Heat is responsible for many dog a euro a euro deaths a euro, 
and not just dogfighting ones. Since one of our goals is to avoid deaths, the first step is to avoid competing in hot weather. An additional consideration is how long to rest before competing. Generally speaking, the longer the better. However, the normal rest period is two months. You can be sure, however, that the other dog will go to the pen as soon as the competition is settled. You will want to make sure your dog is examined by a veterinarian to make sure he is healthy and free of parasites. A good vet, by the way, can be an ace, but they're not easy to get carried away, even if they're more understanding than the general public. The problem is that some states have laws subjecting a veterinarian to reporting any instances in which he thinks a dog was part of a fight, and even if the fight was staged where it is legal, you could run into trouble when you return home. House Of course, many sensitive veterinarians will laugh at gossip for the absurdity of it, but it's understandable that some overly shy individuals will be concerned. After all, they don't want any rumors from their other clients about being fighting dog vets. Normally, if you are going to compete your dog, it is your responsibility to learn something about some medical care to help him after the fight. If you have an understanding veterinarian, abuse him by asking for information about this. Pay him extra if necessary, but learn all you can about caring for a sick dog in battle. Also, this is the time to find out if you can take your dog to him without him needing to report you to animal welfare personnel. It will make a big difference if you can convince your vet that you are taking good care of your dog that you really care for him. I have known more than one breeder who have become absolutely best friends with their vets, merely because they had an intense and sincere interest in canine medicine and spent much of their spare time helping veterinarians, learning a great deal in the process. Conversely, I know of at least two breeders who have taught their veterinarians something, such as ear trimming and little tricks on how to treat a dog in shock. Bob Wallace is one of the two men I'm talking about, and his vet isn't shy about admitting that he learned a few tricks from Bob Wallace, including how to trim his ears. One of the problems with a shelter is that it's hard to start easy, but it's essential that you do. Better to slow down a progression than too fast. If you weaken your dog with too much work, it's a much bigger setback than if you proceeded cautiously. One of the things you need to be very careful about is the dog's paws. They should gradually harden for the work they have to do. Some breeders have a homemade preparation that they put on the dog's paws, and others use commercially available preparations that are supposed to toughen the hunting dog's paws. Your training will consist of walking your dog, having him run on the treadmill, although some dogs were conditioned without it, or on the turntable, or even jogging with the dog. Now, I've heard many of the experts talk about working on the dog's bite and strength, as if that were a natural consequence of conditioning. Such a phenomenon is most likely a combination of circumstances. First, what appears to be an ace bone crusher just doesn't look as good when he goes up against a quality dog. Second, if your conditioning is focused on tolerance, you may neglect the dog's strength, and he may lose some of it. Third, if a dog is brought in very light or dehydrated, he will surely be the weakest. I have found that the most experienced and most successful of conditioners are those that are least likely to dry out your dogs or dehydrate them. The age-old physical reason behind drying the dog is that it reduces bleeding, which is true, and the dogs themselves reduce water intake later in the pen, which is also true. However, a dehydrated dog cannot afford to lose much blood, and its stamina is not as great as the stamina of a dog that has not been dehydrated. 
If the dog reduces its water intake under the influence of exercise work, our modern conditioner simply mixes a little water into its food. Also, today's successful trainers are aware of the fact that animals, including us, have slow twitch and fast twitch muscles. Slow contraction provides hardening but not strength and speed. Therefore, Fast twitch muscles have to be developed as well. Exercises that require speed and strength will help to develop these. A little exercise from catching the cloth attached to a pole, fast runs on the treadmill, and pulling against resistance can help the conditioning aspect. Some conditioners approach the problem by having a hard workday with an emphasis on tolerance, alternating with a shorter workday that emphasizes intensity. Usually, when the agreement for the competition is reached, there is agreement on the spot as to the judge and the rules to be used. Cajun rules are the most common, and they allow for certain options. For example, the score on a scratch can vary as can the count on out of holds. Since our goal is to shorten the fight as much as possible, try a 10 second scratch count. Similarly, keep the count as low as you can for the out of hold time. The only people who argue against short counts are those who are always looking for the glory of no turns and no out of holds competition. I, too, am elated and pay homage to the dogs that endure such competitions. But if the out-of-holds count is ridiculously long, it takes some of the shine off the whole thing. As you enter the last week before the fight, start to cut back on the length and intensity of work. 24 hours before the fight, give your dog a quarter of the work, and in that time give him his last meal as well. Of course, you have been weighing your dog every day and adjusting the food accordingly. Keep track of the dog's weight over a 24-hour period. If his weight drops, give him a mixture of water and nutrients to bring him back down to weight, but not solid food. If your dog is even a few grams overweight, don't be mad if the other guy claims a ticket. This is the price you pay for getting the weight wrong. The other guy probably came in a few inches underweight just to leave him on the sidelines. A lot of people aren't claiming fines just to show their good sports. And, too, a man who has conditioned a dog for two months is reluctant not to go through with the fight, but he must remember his responsibility to his dog and, unless he has an unusual dog, he does not want him to go further against his opponent. Naturally, if you win the coin toss, you will be elected to wash first, as your dog will have much more time to rest in his crate while the other dog is being washed. When you wash the other dog, once again remember your responsibility to your dog. Don't let him down by doing a poor wash job. Harmfully rubbed tails are usually spread but let's pretend they aren't. Even if you and your opponent are the best of friends, wash the dogs anyway just to get rid of the flea spray, and it will be better for both dogs to be clean anyway in case of any injuries they receive. If you miss the coin toss, your opponent will most certainly do the wash first. This leaves you with the choice of corners, which really isn't much. The most you can hope for is to receive the darkest corner, so your opponent's dog won't have a very good view of your dog in your scratches. But most fights are well lit and even, otherwise you could take the highest corner and make your opponent go up for a scratch, so the choice of corners is a sign of advantage. When dogs are fighting, keep a close eye on your dog's mouth to make sure he's not bitten. It rarely happens that a dog becomes bitten, for example, inserting a tooth into or through his own lip, but it's your job to make sure he isn't. If you think he is, let the judge know. Don't talk to your dog too much, he knows more about what he's doing than you do, but try to stay in your field so he knows you're there. 
When he does a particularly good trick or has a good hold, let him know he's doing a good job. Watch for an out by both dogs, and be sure to ask for it even if it's about your own dog, because you want the dogs to scratch as quickly as possible. Once the exit has been called, cooperates with the other handler in separating the dogs from the holds. If it's your dog's turn to scratch, talk to him in the corner, encouraging him and keeping him excited. If it's the other dog's turn, don't talk to your dog at all, simply try to lull your dog to sleep. You want it to have as little stimulation as possible for the scratching dog. Finally, if your dog is out of count or has thus lost the fight, take the first opportunity to congratulate your opponent and don't be afraid to praise your dog, because you both found what you wanted to know, which dog is braver. Finally, if your dog is losing but won't quit, or keep scratching, start thinking in terms of giving up the fight. If your dog is being beaten and still scratching, and the other dog is still scratching well, why let your dog get killed? If he's brave, he's worth keeping, and no one likes to see a dog left too long to be saved. I once saw a trainer completely humiliate his opponent by saying, if you don't get that brave little dog, I'll get mine, and you can take the win. The guy got his dog, too, because he knew the story would run fast on how he won his victory. Also, if you are any kind of breeder in any way, you will feel as close to him as you do to your family, especially after all the hours you spent together while on guard. So pick up your dog and remember the purpose of the ring. It is the proving ground that determines the best of bulldogs. The race isn't always for the swift or the battle for the strong a euro, but that's the way to bet. Damon Runyon Genius does what it must, and talent does what it can. Bulwer Lytton Chapter 11 A Matter of Style Usually, fighting style is almost beside the point. That is, contests are usually win or lose despite the fighting style rather than because of it. Oh, it's true that most breeders prefer the dog's snout or ear while they back off to throw themselves at the dog's leg, but both dogs can win. The reason is that most competitions consist of a hammer and tong phase in which both dogs are throwing the works, here comes the inevitable slowness in which both dogs metal, or enthusiasm to fight, is being tested. Usually this enthusiasm weakens one of the dogs slightly, and he ends up being counted when it is his turn to scratch. In this way, the style ends up being irrelevant to the result. However, there are dogs of unusual ability who completely surpass other dogs and will put them to the ground and out of action so quickly that the competition never reaches a weakening phase in which the dogs are warm, weak, and able to inflict little or no damage. These dogs of unusual ability, called aces, by breeders, will knock a mediocre dog out of action in an instant. The breeder has mixed sympathy for these aces. While the skill of these dogs is admirable, their deep courage is always suspect because they rarely meet a dog to match them, and therefore whether they have courage or not is determinable. Experienced breeders have come to worship courage above all else. Because, in usual competitions, it is the brave dog that wins. Additionally, Breeders have developed a special liking for the pit bull, and courage is the single most important characteristic of the breed. There is nothing more exciting to an experienced breeder than having your dog of guts go up against a barnstormer, hold on, and force the competition into the slow period where guts is essential, and then win by guts. But these aces are kind of annoying to the breeder because they will kill your brave dog if you are foolish enough to leave them in there too long. Many aces have often been bred, 
only to produce litter after litter of cowards. Most likely, many aces haven't had the guts to take what they're given, but no dog has ever come to prove the point. In any case, these aces can have a wide variety of styles. They have such extraordinary athletic ability that they can make their style work, whatever it may be. Generally speaking, however, most breeders prefer a dog that holds its opponent somewhere on the head, preferably the muzzle or ear. There are several advantages to a dog that can successively hold and utilize this hold. Because, he doesn't have to be a strong biter because he can control the other dog and wear him down, such a style is tailor-made for defense, as he holds the other dog, preventing himself from getting held or taking damage. Also, a snout and ear is particularly frustrating for your opponent because the opponent may not even have the satisfaction of making a hold himself, and the more he tolerates it, the faster he wears out. Further on, the harder he pushes, the more damage he does to himself. The snout and ear dog is like a martial arts expert using his opponent's strength against him. Or, if you prefer, the analogy can be taken further as a street fighter going up against an experienced boxer who won't stand by and fight. Going like Barney, Braddock de Curvino, and Boudreaux's Ox are just a few examples of this type of fighter. Even though, for pragmatic reasons, the muzzle and ear fighter is preferred, sentimentally many breeders really like the dog that comes in fighting, that goes for the chest and shoulders, occasionally faking one side and then going the other, right down to the stifle, to the extinction of the other dog. This is a dog ready or not here I come who is always delivering the final attack beforehand, burying his head in the other dog's chest, pushing so hard he lifts the other dog onto his front legs and constantly keeps him off balance. To the Puritan, a pit dog must always go forward, and that's exactly what dogs do, pushing their opponents around the pit. However, a dog using this style needs to have unusual biting power and preferably tolerance, because if he doesn't put his opponent out in a relatively short time, he will wear himself out and then be at his opponent's mercy. That this style can be successful, however, is proved by the fact that one of the greatest of all time has been its clinicians, dogs like White Rock, Zebo, Boomerang, and Jeremiah, to name just a few. Sometimes a type of dog that comes in fighting is called a straight back because they often don't shake a hold and they only have one gear, forward. A dog's leg, however, must continually jerk out of a hold to be successful with this style. Otherwise, the other dog will grab him by the muzzle, even if the other dog is not a the dog, and will immediately lift him out of his hold and severely injure him. There are actually two tactics that a leg dog can successfully use, and we're talking about front legs here, the hind leg or knee of the dog will be discussed later. One is to shake continuously so violently that the other dog cannot catch its muzzle, and the other is to lower the leg, down near the pastern or up to the foot, and drive with that, pushing back between the hind legs. This not only keeps the opponent from getting the dog's muzzle, but also leaves him very little to get. Like the chest and shoulder dog, the leg often needs to be a strong punisher to win. He, too, must expend considerable energy to be successful with his style. The extinguished dog must either be an artist to get back to his favorite hold or he must be profoundly patient. A third alternative is to be versatile enough to a euro e trade euro holds in front until he has the opportunity to get back on the knee. For those unfamiliar with the term, the stifle is a point where the femur, or thigh bone, meets the two lower tibias, the tibia and fibula. In other words, the stifle is the dog's knee. In fact, Dog's hind legs would be a better term for dog's knee, 
as most of them show some variation in how they work the hold once back. Sometimes they go straight to the knee, usually from the front but sometimes from the back, and this can be even more punishing. Others head to the rib area, and normally this is put as highlighted on the knee. One of the problems with being a knee dog is that unless you're unusually cunning, you leave your own knee unprotected, and if your opponent can bite harder than you, then you're in hot water. Some dogs seem at a loss as to what to do when a dog lunges at their knee, but others are quite adept at reaching behind and catching them by the muzzle. Occasionally, a kneeling dog will go into the genital area and thereby gain a reputation as a dirty fighter. In my opinion though, this is normally an accident situation. Very few dogs have any idea what they have with such a hold. And the antidote for those who do is a good dog with a nose and ears. In fact, like all the dogs mentioned above, the kneeling dog is a perfect contrast to the ear and muzzle dog. Although, when I say that, the presumption is automatic that everything else apart from the style is equal, but this is rarely the case. Therefore, a very good dog on the knee, or leg or chest whatever the style, can beat a single dog on the ear. Another style that doesn't get talked about much is what I call the indestructible style. These are dogs that apparently can't be hurt. A dog can knock them down and overwork them, and those dogs come away with nothing more than a bruise. Such dogs are rare but highly prized because they almost always win. Sometimes their styles seem deliberate and obvious. Let the other dog wear itself out for nearly an hour and a half or so, and then when it is completely used and tired of continual fighting for the top and trying to punish from that position, come to the top yourself and proceed to spread the dog fight with a now useless dog. I have seen dogs such as these who take a beating and seem to enjoy it, but if another dog tried to rest for a minute, they grabbed the other dog to get him to continue with the fight, and once he was continuing again, simply go back to the down position, waiting for the inevitable. A strong bite is not important to these dogs, but total doggedness, tolerance, and courage obviously are. The counterpart to the indestructible bulldog is the super strong dog who has strength out of proportion to his size. He doesn't need to have a style, as he is so strong that he can do crazy things that no other dog can. Therefore, I have seen a yellow-colored dog that will grab a dog by the middle of its back and then throw it over its own body to the ground with such force that the dog was literally startled. Another piebald dog I saw in Mississippi in the 1950s would pick a dog his size or larger fully off the ground and shake him like a rag doll. Such dogs are an extravagance because they appear so rarely a euro, but they are obviously spectacular when they do. To a certain extent, I am oversimplifying when I talk about the fighting styles of various fighting dogs, as very few of them have the mentality of that style and nothing else, although many breeders were terrified to see their dog spit a muzzle and grab a leg, and most fighting dogs have a good repertoire of holds a euro, no restriction on style. However, they tend to favor certain holds and maneuvers. Although dogs learn style and technique in their training, they seem to be genetically predisposed to some. Now, since breeding is generally done without regard to fighting style, we can imagine the breed as being a mixed bag with all the traits, stubbornness, and different styles surrounded by a large number of successful fighting dogs. Occasionally, a dog will show that it absolutely has everything from absolute indestructibility to courage to tolerance for strong biting to intelligence in the ring and even to the uncanny ability to fight with any style. Therefore, he can adapt with any fighting style, 
finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability in directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one, Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, needless to say, they are extremely rare. Finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability and directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one, Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, needless to say, they are extremely rare. Finding his opponent's area of a euro a euro vulnerability and directing the appropriate style against him. This is the ace of aces, and I have only seen one, Judd Davidson's Josh, in 1950. I have heard of others but, needless to say, they are extremely rare. Still, after all this discussion of style, I'll close where I started, that is, in de-emphasizing. If I were a breeder I would get a muzzle and ear dog, other things being equal. But that's it. Other things are rarely equated, and courage and tolerance are usually the deciding factors. Besides, a good dog makes any style work, and an extra good dog can break any fighting style. This is known as dogfighting intelligence, and perhaps this should be emphasized a euro, even beyond style. Many mothers would call the police if she saw a horse being handled the way she treats her children. Andrew Salter Chapter 12 The Face of Cruelty Sometimes I feel ashamed of myself for the way I sternly berate humanists, chasing them uphill, downhill, challenging them to debates they stealthily dodge. It's not that I worry that I strike fear into the hearts of humanists or that I think the debate is one-sided, after all, the humanists are the only ones who have the public's ear and sympathy. It's just that I just feel like an evicted humanist, and the only difference between them and me is what we distinguish as cruelty. It's easy for humanists to find cruelty in dog fighting, and it doesn't hurt them one bit to deny breeders passion for their fighting dogs. They make no effort whatever to see things from the other colleague's point of view. They take the white-black, good-evil approach and thus, for them, creators are nothing short of satanic. Humanists are quite happy to see a fighting dog breeder sentenced to jail time, in fact, they are clear that sinners are not being given the maximum amount of time in custody a euro, even though it seems that such space should be reserved for serious sinners who are a danger to society. Humanists probably get a certain purification of the rage they vent towards the fighting dog breeder, and the only sacrifice they make is an occasional contribution. And, of course, professional humanists receive funds and personal publicity. On the other hand, trying as hard as I can, I cannot find cruelty per se in dog competition. I think it is cruel of humanists to be somewhat so anxious to eliminate fighting dogs, that is, euthanizing them every chance they get. No doubt humanists think that fighting dog breeders are crying crocodile tears when their dogs are destroyed by animal welfare groups, but they really care about their dogs, not only as individual dogs in their own right but also because some of the destroyed dogs were famous among fighting dog breeders and were universally revered. To euthanize such admirable and lovable animals does not amount to murder in the eyes of fighting dog breeders, and perhaps the rest of us should see it in the same light. I'm sure some humanist-oriented people are quite sincere in their belief that they are doing the best for the dogs. But many of them know better, and many of them harbor real hatred for the race in their hearts. In view of the fact that I am a lover of pit bulls and have scoffed at the humanists' contention that dogfighting is cruel, it may be presumed that I am a callous type, 
immune to cruelty in all its manifestations. Amazingly though, I seem to see cruelty where others don't, not even humanists. Not that I'm oblivious to any cruelty involving pit bulls, mind you. On the contrary a euro, because I consider the expansion of pit bulls into stray dogs a flagrant abuse of the breed, and I have said so many times. And I don't care and the other dog is two or three times the size of the pit bull. He was not bred to be a fighter and is at a disadvantage for that reason, but more importantly, he wasn't raised to like it. And therein lies cruelty. But there is abundant cruelty, completely removed from the pit bull, that we all partake of, at least indirectly. We just don't have to think about it. We get our hamburgers and hot dogs and rarely, if ever, think about what was done in order to supply us with them. For those who care to know, here's what happens to supply us with milk and veal. Newborn calves are taken almost immediately from their mothers. The calf is taken to the slaughterhouse, and we wait for it to be humanely slaughtered, usually with a blow to the head. The calf that is taken for veal has an even worse fate. He is chained in a dark barn in a stable so small he can hardly move, no feed but milk for a few weeks, and then to the slaughterhouse in the meantime, the poor mother cow who has just as much maternal instinct as human mothers, even more than many I've seen, will cry profusely for weeks over her lost calf. The cow may not be a brilliant animal, but it is certainly hard to believe that such suffering is alleviated by that fact. Heat, this kind of cruelty is perfectly normal, because it benefits humanity. And I doubt many humanists will give up milk or meat in protest. And even I do not advocate that everyone should become a vegetarian, abstaining even from milk, in the name of compassion. Nor will I propose any oppressive law directed at the planters. However, it seems that we can be a little more aware of the tremendous cruelty involved here. But human society has not, to my knowledge, made any significant effort against this practice. With the general public, cruelties that benefit humanity are easy to overlook. However, Hens are kept miserably confined in closed rooms to keep their meat tender and to prevent the eggs from getting bloodstained. And of course, the slaughter of chickens is not a pretty thing to look at, being mostly done on an assembly line, with some of them ending up in the scorching vat still alive, after having their throats slit. I'm often curious about the public's tolerance for bullfighting. Advertisements about bullfighting are carried in newspapers, television, buses, and on bulletin boards. In fact, this year's tagline has been A Euro, A Euro, A Taurus Fever, A Euro, Catch It, A Euro, and reports of the fights are taken to the newspapers, on the sports page. Still, what more vile activity involving animals is there? No matter how much you hide it, it is still a systematic way to torture animals to death for the amusement of onlookers and the glorification of man. I know a euro, at least, that the man there is taking a risk, but not too much. And I'd have a lot more respect for the boastful peacocks if they'd stay inside with the bull while it's fresh and crackling with energy and hate. But no, they dive behind those protective boards and take turns going out to wear it down. So what is cruel and what is not? Is it cruel to allow a hunter to track the raccoon even if it is cut by white heather or barbed wire and perhaps lost? Difficultly. Hunting dogs are better off hunting than eating. However, when we take the raccoon into consideration, we enter the element of cruelty. Is it cruel to allow pointers to point, retrievers to catch, and border collies to stalk the herd? Again, hardly. 
Anyone who knows performance dogs knows that they enjoy the activity they were bred for more. Yet, somehow most people fail to understand that a fighting dog enjoys what he was bred for, too. Once, when I was about 15 years old, I was scolded by a man who bred greyhounds to hunt coyotes for meddling with bulldogs. I was raised to be polite to elders, so I didn't ask him how would letting two dogs do what they wanted to do be worse than letting three greyhounds chase and catch a coyote and kill it. Why didn't this man see things from the coyote's point of view? Everyone seems to have a blind spot in their perception of cruelty. Maybe I have too. Maybe there's cruelty in dogfighting, I just don't see it. But if that's so, why can't the very people who know all about it see it? And why can people who know absolutely nothing about this see it so clearly? And so the mature man will take the word as it is, and inwardly remain undisturbed. Walter Lippmann Their webs were stretched beyond their usual size. And malnourished spiders consumed malnourished flies. Charles Churchill Chapter 13 Into Any Abyss Having been bred as an American pit bull terrier for nearly forty years now, these are the worst of times for me. The breed has become popular, and yet it must be the most hated breed of all time. I don't know of any other race that has even been considered to be exterminated, but this is exactly what many people, good and with good intentions, seriously propose. The justification is that pit dogs are against the law, and if you don't put them to fight, why do you need them? Fortunately, owners of other breeds have been on our side, because they know all too well that if you ban one breed, you can ban others. And what will be next? Rottweiler? Dobermans? Mastiffs? And what about all dogs a euro, as in Iceland? Thanks to media sensationalism, which takes its information from the publicity of hungry humanists, the public's image of race is actually distorted. It is true that there have been some attacks against people by pit bulls, but the publicity generated is almost always out of proportion to the problem. Attacks from other breeds go almost unnoticed, but a pit bull bark makes the front page. This is not pure rhetoric either. My local newspaper had a front page story about a pit bull barking. Somewhere in a minor headline was the story of an outbreak of war in the Middle East. Now, we all know that barking is not a breed characteristic, but neither is it characteristic of them to attack people. However, the public thinks otherwise because the exception ends up on the first page. Certain events develop a momentum of their own, and this seems to be the case with respect to some of the proliferating ideas about the pit bull. We feel powerless to say enough is enough, but we can at least analyze the phenomenon. First, there is the symbiotic relationship between the media and humanists. The media thrives on sensationalism, and humanists thrive on publicity. Such an immoral alliance makes for some truly eccentric stories. These stories, in turn, engender interest in race in exactly the wrong people. These people allow their dogs to attack stray animals in the park or on the street, thereby instilling untold hatred of the breed in the minds of the general public. Even worse, these newbies don't select people with good intentions towards pit bulls, and what was once rare pit bull attacks on people have become commonplace. But even now, the breed doesn't make the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, 
bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. The breed is not in the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. The breed is not in the top 20 list for biting problems. The problem of non-selective breeding was highlighted recently by a fatal attack on a man in a town near here. In this case, the headlines were justified, but the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. But the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. But the end result achieved by the writers was not. They attributed the savage attack, bystanders thought the man was being eaten alive, to the breed being used for fighting. Now, this dog was far from an arena dog lineage as you can see, as he was half staff and had nothing of an arena dog in his pedigree, even going back several generations. Like so many public arrogance, the one who says that fighting dogs are mean to people is absolutely contrary to the fact. The truth is, the closer you are to the arena with an American Pit Bull Terrier breed, the more likely you are to be in trouble, for a variety of reasons. One is that the arena dog breeder is not favorably impressed with dogs that dislike people, quite the opposite, in fact. Consequently they always prune them. Newbies on the other hand, are overwhelmed in large numbers and terrified, not to mention ferocious, towards people. Even so, pit bulls that are a real danger to anyone are quite rare. Taking the 99% of pit bulls a euro, the ones who don't mind people at all a euro, and looking only at those who can be categorized as dangerous against society, we find that most of them are either a euro oshi growler a euro fearful biters or they are a euro or disingenuous a euro. Either one will nip like a regular dog but won't really do much damage. However, once in a lifetime we come across a dog that will attack a person with the same intensity as any other dog. It is this type of dog that is the product of the horrific a euro who is eating him alive, a euro reports. And for the sake of the race, not to mention the people, such individuals should be euthanized. In fact, I am in favor of euthanizing all bulldogs who don't like people, as I consider it essential for the future of the breed. I think in the long run pit bull fans will agree with me. But I would like to emphasize once more that the problems of people biting bulldogs have been, to put it mildly, too flourishing. With these bad times, one saving factor for the breed is that there are many fanatical supporters and advocates. Recently, I was caught up in a conversation with a dog trainer who was familiar with my books, and most other books, too, on dogs, 
and he gave me generous compliments, saying that I would be a world-renowned authority on dogs. If I had simply chosen another race to speak. While I was proud of the compliment, I had to reject it because I really do have a genuine interest in all dogs, I don't study them day and night like many people do. The fact is, I have other interests too. As a science teacher, I am an avid biologist, amateur geologist, and astronomer. Therefore, I go all out that I couldn't possibly be a high authority on dogs. And, even if I were and were recognized as such, I could never resist sponsoring the American Pit Bull Terrier breed. Not that I want the breed to become popular a euro, far from it. A euro, but I don't want hostility or loathing for the dogs. And I can't imagine anyone who's actually known them hating these dogs. All this hate comes from people who know absolutely nothing about them. For example, a favorable review of my book The Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier appeared in Dog Fancy magazine, and that review alone brought a torrent of letters from those angry readers directed at the critic. None of them knew what they were talking about and, of course, none of them had read my books. They were simply angry that the critic had read the books. This is the kind of mentality that comprises the almost tangible mass of hatred against the pit bulldog. Fortunately, the breed has enthusiastic supporters, too. Indeed, their enthusiasm makes my love for dogs seem almost tepid by comparison. And these breeders come from all walks of life and take satisfaction in many aspects of the breed. Perhaps those who have the greatest joy are those who only have one or two dogs and are thus able to give them the proper attention and thereby allow the dogs to reach their full potential as individuals. Others train their dogs as attack and defense dogs and others in obedience work. Still others enter the conformation or weight pulling shows. All these competitions are great fun, and those good old bulldogs, as always, do their owners proud. Heat, there are those who put their dogs in fights, too, although it must be remembered that they are a distinct minority. Nationwide there are approximately only 300 or more who consistently race their dogs. In the past, other devotees of the breed have heaped scorn on fighting dogs, who preferred to be called fighting dog breeders, a term that is more accurate. But why do it? We all put up with them anyway, so why be so concerned about public opinion? Furthermore, if it weren't for these hard-working breeders, there wouldn't be this magnificent breed that we all love. After all, it's not the fighting dog breeders who have their dogs attack strays in the street or who have bred dogs to attack children. And breeders of fighting dogs can fall off the horse, too, as they can be intolerant of pit bulldog breeders who don't want to race their dogs. But they shouldn't be, by trainers, domestic dog breeders, and conformation people also made their contribution. Indeed, it is these people who are at the forefront of opposing oppressive legislation, while the fighting dog breeder keeps his low profiles. The truth is that pit bull breeders a euro divided with them by their philosophies a euro have something important in common, a certain irrational love for a certain unique breed. The breed will likely become more than solid over time a euro, and no one knows just how solid a euro but pit bull friends, devoted as they are, are not to be underestimated. The world is in for solid times, too, and no one can say how solid, perhaps famine, perhaps widespread terrorism, perhaps nuclear demise, but pit bull breeders, not discouraged, draw strength from their brave little dogs and thank each day with renewed vigor and enthusiasm.